Hey ballerinas, welcome back to Reformation Rambles, a series where I talk to you all about the history of the European Reformation. Today we'll be talking about Pope Julius III. Born Giovanni Maria Ciocci del Monte in 1487 in Monte San Savino. I will mostly just be referring to, his, to him as Julius just for to save on confusion, <laughs> just be aware that he wasn't born with that name. Okay, so he was Pope from 1550 to 1555. His reign would be marked by blocked attempts to reform the church and the gay scandal. <laughs> we'll get back to that, but first let's talk about who Julius was. Part 1. A lawyer politician. Young Julius was educated by the humanist Pael Brandolini Lippo, and later he studied law. As a result, throughout his career, he'd be defined as a canonist, um, which is someone who worked on canon law. Canon law were the laws the Catholic Church put in place for Christendom, essentially. As a result of this education, he wasn't really seen as a theologian. He was generally liked by multiple accounts. He was friendly and personable, and really respected for his administrative skills. He'd be governor of Rome twice in his life. At the sack of Rome in 1527, Julius was actually one of the hostages taken by the Holy Roman Emperor's men, narrowly swerved being executed. This just shows how valued he was, otherwise his capture would not have been worthwhile. And this is before he was even a cardinal. As well as his roles in the church, in 1536 he was employed as papal legate, or like pope lawyer, and co-president of the first Council of Trent. Now, we talked about the Council of Trent before in the Counter-Reformation video, if you're interested, where are we going? Watch that up there. After all this, it's kind of wild that he sort of abstained from Italian political affairs when he was Pope, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. It's time for part two. Accidentally winning an election. <laughs> before we get to the election itself, let's quickly cover how Julius moved through the ecclesiastical. Right. So he was the nephew of the Archbishop of Monfredum. It's nobody gets anywhere without family in high places. So when this uncle gets promoted to Cardinal in 1511, Julius took his place. Now, as well as becoming Bishop of Pavia around the same time. And then in 1536, Pope Paul III would make him a Cardinal. He was Cardinal of Palestina. So fast forward to 1550. There are 38 Cardinals trying to pip, pick the next pope. They're divided. So there's the imperial faction who care about the interests of the Holy Roman Empire, who want to see the Council of Trent reconvened. Then there's the France, French faction who want to see the Council of Trent scrapped. It's hard to find any reason why beyond just they hate the Holy Roman Empire and want the opposite of what they do. And the Farnese faction who supported sort of the family line of the last Pope. So they just wanted Paul III's grandson, Alessandro Farnese, to be the next Pope. Essentially, these three factions just reached a deadlock. No one was budging, no one was changing their minds. And there was looking like they were really going to struggle to find a majority. Now, it should be noted, Julius was not on the Holy Roman Emperor's list of approved candidates. <laughs> and France didn't favour him either. But because of this prolonged deadlock, Julius became the compromise candidate, and that's how he became Pope. Part 3. Reformer, but not really. As a papal candidate, he wanted to reform the Catholic Church and reconvene the Council of Trent, do all that jazz, but very little actually changed under his rule. He sort of half-heartedly tried to reform the Church, but he was victim to international politics, that made that quite difficult. Allow me to explain. Uh, 1551, Julius consented to the reopening of the Council of Trent, which France were fuming about. Henry II of France had already threatened to just not recognise a pro-Habsburg Pope. Uh, remember the Imperial faction? Uh, that would be the pro-Habsburg faction, who, if you'll recall, wanted to see the Council of Trent reconvened. So Henry blocked French bishops from attending and he refused to enforce papal decrees in France. In the end, this would result in Julius entering a league against both the Duke of Parma and Henry II of France that would become the War of Parma in 1553. 
1553, the two factions would reach an agreement and Julius would just suspend the Council of Trent because it's just easier guy. So he's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. But he still did a few things. He was a friend of the Jesuits. We gave fresh confirmation in 1550. Again, if you want more information, go watch the Counter-Reformation video. And he founded the Collegium Germanicum. Or is it Germanicum? I don't know. He did Latin for like two years, but can't remember how to pronounce words. In 1552. This was a German-speaking seminary for German Catholic priests who happened to be in Rome. And during this time it basically taught them to defend the faith against the rising tide of Protestantism in Germany. It actually still exists today, though I imagine the teachings have changed somewhat in the past 500 years. He also oversaw England's return to Catholicism under Mary I, and just before his death in 1555 he sent Cardinal Giovanni Maror to represent papal interests at the Peace of Augsburg. So he didn't do nothing, but he isn't remembered for any of this. Oh no. He is remembered for a scandal that rocked 16th century Catholicism. So, chapter 4. A big gay scandal. Enter Innocenzo, a young beggar who Julius' family took in from the streets of Palestina, made a whole boy, and eventually Julius' brother would adopt the boy. So he was a, his adoptive nephew, making what followed weird. It's weird. When Julius became Pope, he gave Innocenzo a lot. <laughs> Start with some classic nepotism. Nepotism, if they're not related by blood, I think it still is. It doesn't matter. <laughs> he is made Vittorio of the abbeys of St. Sober, Miramondo, Ferrato and Frascati, and I've definitely pronounced those names wrong so they will be up on the screen. He also made him chief diplomatic and political agent. Now he had all these jobs but he's essentially a 16th century street urchin. <laughs> Barely literate, he doesn't behave like the upper classes at all. And a lot of people in power viewed him as very rude. Now whether he was actually rude or just didn't speak the way people were taught to speak in these positions is hard to say, but either way they didn't like him. <laughs> And essentially he couldn't do these jobs, he was completely incompetent. It wasn't uncommon for people in power to give jobs to those they were close to, even if they weren't particularly suited to the job. But Julius gave Innocenzo so many positions, he was making more money than some very powerful established families. I read that he made more than the Medici family, which is just insane. It's batshit. <laughs> so rumours start to swirl around Julius's relationship with this boy. From most sources I found, people are basically guessing the age of this boy. We can assume he was significantly younger than Julius. Whether he was a child is highly debated, but... Uh, uh, I hope not. <laughs> oh. Now, Thomas Beard wrote that it was Julius's custom to promote non to ecclesiastical living to save only his buggerers. Now, this was written in 1497, 42 years after Julius' death. So you can be excused for believing it's a rumour passed on after his death by his enemies and all of his political opponents. And if this was all the evidence, I'd agree with you, but it's not. Now, rumours of this relationship spread throughout Julius' time as Pope. And Julius refused to take any advice from his cardinals regarding this relationship. A man named Lucio would refer to Julius as odd in the head, which some think is 16th century for gay. <laughs> this was in a letter to the governor of Milan. He was allegedly like a lover awaiting a mistress when expecting Innocenzo in Rome. And apparently he'd boast about how good Innocenzo was in bed, which is um, less subtle, isn't it? <laughs> the Venetian ambassador entered at the time on how often Innocenzo was in Julius's bed. The Pope's reputation was very tarnished by this, as I'm sure you can imagine. His enemies pushed the scandal. It's breaking news. In the streets going, look how corrupt the church has become. All this money and power to his gay lover. I don't think I need to say this, but I'm going to cover myself. Being gay was seen as a terrible thing in this time in Europe. Christianity was very anti-gay, we'll talk about how that happened, because it wasn't always. 
one day but I'm trying to sort of project the views of people at that time I don't agree with them I'm gay I don't hate myself that much <laughs> Julia's was referred to as a sodomite covered in shameful ulcers presumably the ulcers are because of the gay I don't know what I'm talking about <laughs> some people said it wasn't a carnal relationship and Innocenzo was simply his bastard son which <laughs> I think they're lying to themselves but you can believe what you want. After Julius died, Innocenzo would be exiled for murder for a while. He tried for rape but let off because the women were of lower class. They were untrustworthy. I hate history sometimes. I hate it. History. Oh. So he was an awful person but this isn't a video about him. Innocenzo would eventually be buried beside Julius. No homo though, bro. That is the scandalous life of Pope Julius III. I really hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please give me a cheeky like and subscribe. You know in the comments if I touched on something you'd like to know more about. And I'll see you guys later. Bye!